Let's just pray and then we will begin again. Father, you know the uh, mass of material that I have in front of me and you also know our hearts and what we need to hear. And I ask that your spirit would guide us now so that we move at your speed and just pause where you want us to and move fast where you want us to. Thank you that you're with us and that you're here to bless us and teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, just rounding off what we were saying in, at the end of the last lecture. You remember we were questioning the title of this series. And I gave you three possible titles and asked you which one you would prefer if you had to choose one. And most of you, and that was fine, chose the third one. I, I was suggesting that all of them, and I know I didn't give you that option, all of them are brilliant titles. So getting the king out of the boy, we looked at that. How about building the king into the boy? And that suggests that really it was the work of God through his spirit who turned David into, from a human point of view, the greatest king Israel ever had. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, and we'll be looking at this in a later lecture, but 1 Samuel 16, 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And so there's no doubt that 1 Samuel sees what God's Spirit was doing inside of David as a major factor in him becoming the king that he eventually was. And so that's a great title. Or we could have chosen, and this was the title that, that most of you chose, Training the Boy to be a King. And that implies, of course, that, that God was working with David and that even in the everyday of life, David was learning things that would enable him to step into the assignment that God had for him. I don't know how many messages you have heard. I've heard lots and lots and lots of messages on David throwing the stone which took out Goliath. And I've heard descriptions of the kind of helmets that the Philistines had, etc. And that this stone was supernaturally guided to hit Goliath in the only part of his face, his head, that was, that was visible right here in the forehead. And that's a great message, this uh, Holy Spirit guided stone. But I would suggest that actually David learned to throw a stone, not from Bible study, but he learned it from being a shepherd. One of the things I've been told is that those shepherds and shepherds today in the Middle East practice many, many, many times as they're growing up with a sling. And a shepherd in the Middle East can throw a stone with his sling and hit a reed, hit a, a rush at 20 metres. And so, yes, I've no doubt the Holy Spirit was involved in David becoming the person God wanted him to be, but I'm also sure that David applying himself and working hard and learning skills was also part of him becoming the person God wanted him to be. So, I think that every one of those titles would have been a great title. We're going for, just because I think it's a, you know, it's just a bit, bit slicker, getting the king out of the boy sounds cool to me. All right, C. And we're going to move fast now with these final two things because I want to get on to the next lecture where we really start to dig into the text. What is the challenge of this series? The challenge of this series is that there were so many opponents to David, to you, to me, stepping into the assignment God has for us. The first opponent, obviously, was the enemy all around him. 127 times it talks about the Philistines or the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were an ancient people and they lived to the south and the west of Israel. And whenever Israel stopped moving on with God, the Philistines would press in. 
and they would seek to either claim new territory from the Israelites or reclaim old territory from the Israelites. Now, I'm not going to read any of these 127 references. I mean, in, in a few lectures, we're going to step into 1 Samuel 17 and we're going to encounter Goliath the Philistine. And we're going to read again and again and again. The Philistines gathered their forces. The Philistines came against Israel. The Philistines fought against David. One of the... Uh, I love doing jobs at home. I love it. It kind of... You can see something for what you've done at the end. But one of the things I don't like is gardening. I hate gardening. And I've realised one of the reasons why I hate gardening is that you do a lot of work on the garden and the moment you stop working on the garden it starts reverting back to what it was before you do all the work. The flipping weeds start growing again. And it seems to me that there is a kind of an equivalent in our walk with the Lord. That when we stop walking with the Lord, our own particular Philistines, our own particular weeds come back again. And for one of us it might be fear, and for another of us it might be anxiety, and for another it might be depression, and for another it might be anger, and for another it might be loneliness, and for another it might be despair. But there are enemies that we will fight on a fairly regular basis between now and when we check out and go to be with the Lord. The enemy all around. And then there was an enemy alongside if the Philistines are mentioned 127 times, Saul, the man who is king, when David is anointed as king by Samuel, the existing king, Saul, is one of the biggest enemies that David ever faced. He's mentioned 307 times. And Saul began by kind of being intrigued by David. When David stepped out to fight Goliath in chapter 17, verse 55. We read this. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistines, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is that young man? So he doesn't know much about David. He's intrigued by him as he goes out to fight the Philistine. But it's not long before David having killed Goliath the armies are returning from the battle and the women come out and they sing a song and the song went to number one in all the charts around the nations, all around them, we're going to see that. And the kind of chorus in the song, you probably remember it, you can read it in 1 Samuel 18 verses 6 through 9. They danced and sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands which didn't go down too great with Saul. The next verse says this, Saul was very angry. And from here on in, Saul is increasingly determined to kill David. Right through to the end of 1 Samuel. So if the first enemy was the enemy all around him, the Philistines, the second enemy was a supposed leader of God, a supposed leader of God's people, who was actually opposed to what God was doing in David's life. Hello? I've got to be really careful saying what I'm about to say, but as I look back over my Christian experience, honestly, hand on heart, the things that have, felt, uh, have made me feel like throwing in the towel more than anything else, have been actually at times other Christians. People I worked alongside, people in the same church, leaders that I, I, I kind of rub shoulders with. And maybe in 15, 20 years, you'll be emailing me and saying, Rob, when you said that, I didn't believe it. But boy, I believe it now. You know when people change churches? Now there can be very good reasons for that. You know, you move with a job or you move with your studies or whatever. You move to a different area so you go to a different local church. I get that. But quite often we move churches when there's no geographical reason to do that. 
And usually we can dress it up and say, well, it was the theology or it was the emphasis or it, it was this or it was that. And when you scrape down beneath the presented reason, very often the reason is, I couldn't believe the way that some of the Christians in that church dealt with me and my family when we were struggling. It was just heartbreaking. And so this enemy alongside it is one that we're going to take a good look at. And we're going to figure out how Saul was ticking and what it was that was causing him to come against David so often. And then finally, there is the enemy inside. There is David himself. If the Philistines are mentioned 127 times, Saul 307 times, David is mentioned 471 times. And one of the biggest enemies to David moving on with God and stepping into what God wanted him to do on the planet, one of the biggest problems in David's life was David. <laughs> now, we've seen that, haven't we, already with Abraham? We've seen that Abraham was a walking contradiction. That there's some incredible stuff about Abraham, but there's also some not very wonderful stuff about Abraham. Well, exactly the same with David. Do you remember me telling you the story about Michael Caine, the actor? And that Michael Caine one day was uh, filming a scene and he stepped uh, into a room. It was actually set up like a bar. And as he stepped through the doorway, somebody had left a chair overturned by the side of the doorway. And so he said, hey, stop. So they stopped filming. And they got the set right, and then he filmed that scene. Later that day, the director, who was an old man, came to him and said, Michael, why did you go out of character and say, stop filming? And he said, well, well that overturned chair shouldn't have been there. And he said the director said something to him that transformed his life, not just as an actor, but as a man. He said, Michael, use the difficulties. When stuff comes into your world that shouldn't be there as an actor, use it. So if we'd been filming a farce, you could have tripped over the chair. If we were filming a thriller, you could have kicked the chair out of the way and just stalked into the, the bar. Michael used the difficulties. And I have to remind myself of this again and again and again because I don't like it. But usually the area where God is trying to change me and grow me is highlighted or highlight, whatever the past tense of high, is highlight in the areas where I'm having difficulties. The areas I can't do anything about, the areas that keep coming back, the stuff that really pulls me down is the area where God wants to grow me and get the king out of the boy. In Psalm 23, David, right at the centre of that psalm, says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What's a table? A table is where you eat. What happens when you eat? You grow. And David has come to realise that God grows me in the presence of enemies whether it's the Philistines or it's Saul or it's me making stupid decisions myself. Finally, the discoveries of this journey, of this series. And I would suggest, first of all, we're going to find, and I'm just going to list these, I'm not going to speak about them. Uh, and by the way, you can download the screenshots Charlotte's made them available right now, so you, you could download them. Because with some of this, you probably wouldn't have enough time to, to write everything down. But first of all, there were a whole bunch of things that were awesome about David. First of all, David made some awesome choices in his life. The first choice we're going to see him making is to do something that nobody else was prepared to do which was to have a fight with Goliath. Nobody else was, was up for that, but David was. So he, he makes the decision to take Goliath out. 
And then we're going to see later on that he, a couple of times, makes the decision to let Saul off. When Saul has been trying to kill him and kill him and kill him and kill him and kill him. And David is in a position where it would have been so easy to slit Saul's throat in a cave. And everybody's saying, do it, do it, do it. And David says, I'm not going to raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. And then later on, when Saul's in some kind of deep sleep and David is stood over him with a javelin. And, and the guy with him is saying, kill him. And David said, no way. Not only is David prepared to fight an enemy that nobody else was prepared to go anywhere near, but listen carefully, David makes the choice not to stab his enemies in the back. Now let's bring that into our, our situation. Not to gossip about. Not to verbally abuse. Not, not to be nasty about somebody who's been very nasty to me. David makes some fantastic choices. He also makes some awesome creations. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but many of David's Psalms, and I've written them there, and so if you download the screenshot, you'll be able to look at them you know, at your leisure. But many of David's most beautiful Psalms were written when he's going through all the stuff that we're going to look at. There was one time a gentleman who was training an opera singer. And he thought she was brilliant and so he um, contacted a gentleman who was, you know, absolutely top of the, of the food chain in terms of employing and evaluating and putting into key singing roles men and women opera singers. And so he got this expert along to listen to the woman that he was mentoring and she sang and when she'd finished and she went into the into the dressing room this expert came to her mentor and said you're right she has a beautiful singing voice but then he said but she'll sing more sweetly when her heart has been broken when she's been through problems and difficulties there'll be a, a, a tone and, an, uh, and a winsomeness and that in her singing which isn't there right now. Then you show me a Christian who's been through some horrible situations, who hasn't walked away from Jesus but has clung on to him. And I'll show you somebody who's becoming a key player in the kingdom of God. And then David made some awesome companions. Just, just jot those references down or look at them when you download the screenshot. All the time, David is going through the battles and the difficulties and the training program that nearly kills him. God keeps bringing people to him. And these are awesome soldiers. One of them is a guy who went down into a snowy pit on a day and killed a lion. Others were guys who could use bows and slings, right-handed and left-handed. Some of them, it says of them, I, I just, just love the quote. It says, their faces were the faces of lions and they were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. These Gadite commanders, the least of them was match for a hundred and the greatest for a thousand. It's, you know, like attracts like. We attract into our world people who harmonise with what's going on deep inside of us. And when we're having struggles and battles and it's hard and we want to quit but we don't quit and we just stay close to Jesus, guess what? Other people are seeing that and God's working in their life as well. David made some awesome companions. And I've just reminded us of what we said earlier on. Beware of the overbalance of worm theology. Rob, what are you talking about? Well, it is true that David said on one occasion, I am a worm, absolutely, I'm useless, I'm a waste of space. But I do not think that God wants us walking around as followers of Jesus, saying to ourselves and anybody else who listen, I'm useless, I'm no good, I'm a waste of space. Those are labels that Jesus has not stuck on us. And there's an awful lot that is awesome about David. But there are also some things that were awful about David. 
He makes some terrible decisions. He does some things that when you look at them, you think, this is, this is doing to others what Saul was doing to him. What's this about? Now, I'm not going to go through those, but we will be visiting them as we work our way through this teaching. So I wanted to end just by mentioning the use of the word pure in the New Testament. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 5, Paul writes and says this. He's talking about good teaching. And he says the purpose of this command is love which comes from a pure heart. In other words, God wants to work deep inside of us and purify us inside. Now, what does the word pure mean? Well, 2,000 years ago, it was used in three different kinds of contexts. First of all, it was used when they were collecting harvest. And they would go out into the fields with the scythes and the sickles and chop the stuff down, bundle it up, come and stick it in a big pile. And that big pile was a mix of valuable stuff and rubbish. And so what they would do is, they would thresh that pile. Thresh, the old English word thresh, is very closely linked to the word thrash. They would actually pound it, and in pounding it, they would separate the, the grains of wheat or whatever from all the rest that was rubbish. And they'd gather together the nutritious stuff, and that was called the pure harvest. That was the stuff that you could eat, and it would nourish you and grow you. The word pure was used secondly of metals. They would dig stuff out of the rock, and then they would take it to a furnace, and they would grind the rock to powder, and they would mix it with flux, with chemicals, and then they would put intense heat on, and what would happen is that the rubbish would, would, come, would float to the surface, it would be attracted by the, the flux, the chemicals that they'd mix with it, that rubbish would float to the surface, you'd skim it, up, skim it off and throw it away, and what would be left would be precious metal, and they call that pure metal. And then thirdly, If you had a whole bunch of soldiers in the Roman army and they were applying for one of the elite regiments, in the, in the British army that would be the paratroopers or it would be the SAS, the special air services. I'm sure in your country you would have similar units in, in the army that were the elite soldiers. They would put those guys through a process that would nearly kill them. And one after another would be dropping out, dropping out, can't do this, can't handle this, count me out, don't want to go on. And eventually you would be left for every hundred with probably nine or ten soldiers who were good enough for the elite regiments. They were called pure soldiers. And so in the New Testament, what the Lord Jesus wants to do in my life and your life Notice how things were made pure, by the way, by being thrashed, by being exposed to intense heat, by being put through a training program that nearly killed you, and out the other end of that come people who nourish other people, who are precious, courageous, key players in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. And so that's what we are going to be looking at. Alan Redpath, who used to work here, in his book on David, which you can find in the library, it's entitled The Making of a Man of God. He says this, the conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment. Coming to Jesus and receiving his forgiveness is the miracle of a moment but the making of a man or woman of God is the labor of a lifetime.
Okay, while you're copying that down, I'm going to read 1 Samuel chapter 16 and the first 13 verses. Because what we'll be looking at in the rest of this session and then the next session are these verses. These are all about finding God's will for your life. How you find out what God wants you to do. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen, bing bong, one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll sh I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked him, do you come in peace? This is some man of God. And when Samuel turns up, whoa, what's this about? Samuel replied, verse 5, Yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. He's the oldest, just trust me in that. When you read later on, it tells you, the, it tells you the, um, how the different sons are related to each other and Eliab is listed as the oldest. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't look at things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, he was the next down in age, and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen, bing bong, this one either. Jesse then made Sharma. He was the next one passed by, but Samuel said, No, has the Lord chosen, bing bong, this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen, bing bong, these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Well, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him, we'll not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him, he is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went down to Ramah. Okay. What we're going to do as we look at uh, these 13 verses is look at, first of all, the theology of God choosing people. Why I kept going bing bong was to alert you to how many times in that passage it talks about God choosing people. And we are going to have a look at the theology of God choosing people. And for some of you, this is going to blow you sideways. I promise you. And that's going to take our one and a quarter sessions today. And maybe a little bit next time as well. Uh, but then we're going to have a look at the practicality of God choosing people. We're going to have a look at how we discover God's will for our life. But we're going to do what the Apostle Paul did we're going to begin with the theology. Paul in his writings, very often, he begins with doctrine, and then you have, partway through, that little word, therefore, and he applies the doctrine, the teaching, that he's just been explaining. Okay, so, Big question, what is God's choice in the Bible usually about? Now, 
just to go through the bing bongs again remember what i said a long time ago <clears throat> if you want to get the emphasis from a passage that god wants you to get from that passage look at what is repeated it's so easy to look at a passage and simply see in it the projection of my own ideas the opinions i have the views i have and here's a passage on this illustrates what i already thought that actually is not great what we should do is look for an idea or a concept or a word that keeps being repeated and say aha that's what god is seeking to draw my attention to so 1 samuel 16 verse 1 talking about saul the lord says i have rejected him and then saying go to jesse of bethlehem i've chosen one of his sons and then chapter 16 verse 7 about the oldest boy the lord has rejected him and then the next oldest in verse 8 neither has the lord chosen this one and on and on and on we go with references to chosen all right so i'm not a prophet as far as i know but i would be willing to bet forget 1 samuel 16 for a moment i would be willing to bet for many of us here when we see the word chosen or elect we instantly knee jerk think about chosen for salvation here is somebody god chose aha that is to save them here's somebody god did not choose aha that is this person's fast tracked to hell do you remember um i talked to you a couple of weeks ago about having hearing aids fitted and when the guy had looked at the chart having analyzed my hearing he said to me rob there are certain frequencies that you either are not hearing at all or you're not hearing at the correct volume and so all this stuff now is digitalized and all the rest of it and we have programmed these hearing aids especially for you and what they're going to do is balance out your hearing so then he fit them and he said in a moment i'm going to activate them boom you're going to become airborne he said but i need to warn you that it is going to sound really weird he said because you don't only hear with your ears you do hear with your ears your ears are like microphones that pick up the sound waves and then in your inner ear these three bones start vibrating and they vibrate against this funny looking thing it looks almost like a little shell or something coiled up and it's that's full of fine little hairs and there's fluid in there and as these things are vibrating against that in a very sophisticated way those vibrations caused by sound waves are now changed to signals that your brain can process and that signal goes into a certain part of your brain that processes the sound and then you hear he says well for 10 years you've been hearing incorrectly so when we put these hearing aids in it is going to sound all wrong all right here is a prediction for many of you here what we're going to look at now for many of you is going to sound all wrong all right you're going to think oh intuitively this is wrong la 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 don't want to hear it okay maybe it is wrong and maybe it's the holy spirit alerting you throw this out because it's rubbish or just maybe some of your programming may be wrong so let me really quickly uh, summarize for you what many people respond how they respond when they hear the word chosen okay and chosen is part of an understanding of salvation and i'm going to try and present this as clearly as i can and this view of salvation says and we looked at this earlier on this morning that because adam and eve rebelled against god we are now inheritors of a number of things from them we have inherited their fallen nature left to ourselves we are enemies of god we are foreigners to the life of god 
We don't want God in our life. There's nothing in us left to our own devices that would respond positively to God. We also have, have inherited their guilt and their condemnation. So we are in really serious trouble. And I would suggest that, that most Christians, and I would be one of them, would, would agree with, <coughs> excuse me, with that analysis. But then we, we move on and say, therefore, if anybody's going to be saved at all, God has got to do the whole thing from start to finish. We can bring nothing to the table. And therefore, God chooses those he will save. And it's like, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in. God influenced by nothing outside of himself, chooses who will be saved. Now, some people who hold this view will, will go a little bit further, and I think this is logical and they're right. They will say, and God also chooses who will be damned. That's called double predestination. So it not, it's not just that he's actively saying, I'm saving you, and I've decided to save you and I've decided to save you and I've decided to save you and you and you it's not just that and all the rest of them are just going to be left to their own devices and go to hell their own sweet way but some people would go further and say God is actively saying and also I am choosing to damn you I'm choosing to damn you I'm choosing to damn you I'm choosing to damn you that's called double predestination which seems a bit harsh and the people who soften that and say, no, 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 he's only choosing some, the others are just going their own sweet way. That feels a bit less horrible. But I don't think the scriptures will allow you to make that fancy little footwork. First of all, from a logical point of view, if I'm choosing to save you and you, by definition, I'm deciding not to save you. That would just seem logic. But can I point something out to you in the text that we just read, which is really important, the first person that the Lord is talking about, the eldest brother, uh, and it says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 of the eldest brother, I have rejected him. Okay? It doesn't just say I've passed over, I've rejected him. And then the next verse, verse 8, when the next brother comes along, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Hello? That either is really important. So I draw from that, please listen carefully, that God not choosing is exactly the same as God rejecting. We can't do fancy footwork. And so if I held a view which I'm outlining, which I don't hold, I would hold to double predestination. That God has actively chosen who will be saved and he has actively decided to reject and damn those he's not going to save. Now that, for many of us, although we may not know that theological system, we still have bought into the idea when God chooses somebody in the Bible, it is for salvation. Okay? Now I have two responses to that whole system. Number one, does that seem like Jesus? Now I know that's touchy-feely and subjective and oh, very slippy, does that seem like, but does it seem like Jesus? Is Jesus going around the streets of Jerusalem and the lanes of Galilee, selecting some people and damning other people? Or does he seem to welcome all who come to him? Personally, seems that, ah, Rob, but what about the disciples? Well, hang on, we're going to look at that in a minute. What about the disciples? He, didn't he say to the disciples, you didn't choose me, but I chose you? Absolutely, but read that in its context. It's not a verse floating in midair. It's in the middle of a passage, which we're going to look at in a few minutes. Secondly, does that system that I just outlined to you cause you to fall down in rapturous love to Jesus and to God. 
that one day hopefully you'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb and there may be your mum and your dad and there may be that little baby brother that died when he was two weeks old and loads of your friends who are not there and they're in hell and why are they in hell because God predestined you to be in heaven and predestined chose them to be in hell and there was nothing that they could do about that there was absolutely nothing that they could do to change God's mind or to influence that decision now people who hold the view that I outlined and there are many and they love Jesus and they take the Bible seriously I have the hugest respect for them because they are standing by that understanding of of soteriology of, of how God saves people even though they know this isn't very I, I don't really like this but hey that's the way God made it well you know full marks to you for your adherence to what you believe is the Word of God but I don't think we are forced to read the scriptures like that I think there are other ways of reading the scriptures that in my opinion are truer to the text see when I was reading some commentaries about 1 Samuel chapter 16 from some writers who held the view that I just outlined now I want to be fair to them I don't want to caricature them they said this passage this choice of David illustrates not it is but it's a picture of an illustration of God choosing people for salvation what does David bring to the table nothing what do we bring to the table for salvation nothing David seems the least suited and and so often the ones whom God chooses for salvation are not many wise not many not many wealthy not many would rate very highly on the world's Richter scale we see God's sovereignty in choosing David the brothers didn't influence who was chosen it was God who said I'm choosing David I'm not choosing these other guys it was simply down to God it is God who makes David suitable when he calls him the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David and David is equipped David is bringing nothing to the table well I don't agree that David is bringing nothing to the table that's why I spent so long looking at, at the stuff that David brought in terms of the sling and, and being a fighter and all the rest of it and finally they would say notice that God preserves David against all opposition and all enemy activity when God predestines to save us all hell can't change our destination in heaven well if you held the view that I just outlined I guess this is uh, a good illustration but of course and, and I'm sure the people who use that as an illustration know this that is not what this passage is about at all this passage has nothing to do with making David a member of the people of God it has nothing whatsoever to do with David becoming a believer and a follower of Yahweh it has nothing to do with that whatsoever you see if it has to do with that if this passage is talking primarily about being saved or being right with God or being a member of God's family if that's what this passage is about we have some massive problems don't we we have the massive problem that none of David's brothers are chosen we have an even bigger problem that nobody else in the whole of Israel is chosen and finally and perhaps the biggest problem of all is that the God who chose Saul King Saul you did this with Andy look at the words that are used of God choosing Saul and the words are exactly the same as God choosing David God chose Saul the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Saul when enemies are trying troublemakers are trying to take out Saul God protects Saul and so if we're using this passage to say well this is all about salvation well then you have people being saved and lost you have Saul being chosen and then you have Saul being rejected so 
I'm just going to say this and then we'll have a, a short break. Let's consider what God's choice in the Bible is usually about. Now this is the bit that if you've not got the right hearing aids in, you'll say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, I don't like this, this is wrong. All I did was type into my search engine in my uh, Bible software the word choose, choice, chosen, elect, all words like that, and a whole big list of stuff comes up. And you read it, and you read it in its context. And you know what you see? Fasten your seatbelts. You see in the scriptures that when God chooses an individual, it is either exclusively or primarily for service. It has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with eternal salvation. Now I've stated that, you've got to go away and study that. I I'm going to give you a few references, but, but you go away and check it out. Now that obviously is true in 1 Samuel 16, isn't it? Yes, Rod. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. I have rejected Saul as king. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. I've chosen one of Jesse's sons to be king. The whole choice in 1 Samuel 16 has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with the assignment, the role that God had for David. Now you will find that principle again and again and again and again and again and again as you go through scripture. Please just, just for a moment, stop, stop saying in your mind, but what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about? What about Ephesians chapter 1? What about Romans chapter 9? What about, what about? Hey, just, just we're going to come to them. Just, just leave them. We'll look at those in a minute. I'm just trying to show that when you see the word chosen in the Bible, don't need your default to, oh, this is God having decided to save this person from before the creation of the space-time continuum. Exodus chapter 31, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. But what's the context? Verse 6. Moreover, I have appointed, that's a different word, I have appointed Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him, the man we've just seen that God chose. I've given skill to all the craftsmen to make everything I have commanded. In the context, God is choosing men to build the tabernacle. It has nothing to do with salvation. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 5. For the Lord your God has chosen them and their descendants... Beg your pardon... The Lord God has chosen them and their descendants out of all your tribes to minister and stand in the Lord's name always. This is a lineage, a line, starting with an individual and then the descendants of, of, of that individual to be priests and serve in the tabernacle. It has nothing to do with salvation. I don't know how much of this to keep on reading. I mean, it, it, it's just the same all over the place. Let, let's look at the New Testament, okay? Luke chapter 6, verse 13. Right. Remember that Jesus has loads of disciples. He has lots and lots and lots of disciples. And they're all at different degrees of discipleship. Some are fake, some are real, etc. There's a whole bunch of people who turned up when Jesus was speaking and would describe themselves as his followers. Luke 6, verse 13, when morning came, he called his disciples to him. These are people who are already following him. And he chose 12 of them to go to heaven when they die. Is not what it says. <laughs> he chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. He's choosing these to be the 12 apostles the ones upon whom he would build his church. 
Incidentally, one of the ones he chose was Judas Iscariot. Now, John chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus says to the 12 apostles, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. I chose you for a ministry. I chose you to go out and heal the sick and give hearing to the deaf and all the rest of it. He chose them for service. He did not choose them in the context for salvation. Acts chapter 1 verse 24. This is when Judas has blown it and the church is praying, so who should we have as a replacement for the twelfth apostle? Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show, which, show us which of these two you have chosen. And in the context, that is to replace Judas Iscariot as the twelfth apostle. Acts chapter 15 verse 7. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Whenever it is an individual who is chosen in Scripture, it is either exclusively or primarily for service. Which is why I can say it, that that little system that we looked at, yes we are, yes we are affected by Adam's sin, absolutely. Yes we are enemies of God, absolutely I agree with that. Yes we are strangers to the life of God, absolutely. But when we start factoring into that, that God is playing eeny, meeny, miny, more with people, reject, 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 you know, elect, 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 reject, etc. Before the creation of the world, I want to know where does that... I understand the logic of that. If none of us is, is ever going to turn to God under our own strength, then I get the idea of God, you know, chose, chose, reject. I understand, I understand the logic of it. I just don't see it in the Bible. Okay, let's have a five-minute break till 12 o'clock, and then we'll get into stuff that's even more controversial. All right. Thank you.